So good evening, everybody. Thank you very much for having come this evening for this springtime uh, lecture uh, with Jeremy, Jeremy Fuller, whom I'm very happy to greet this evening. The choice is without a uh, little unexpected insofar as intuitive the proximity between humanitarian work at MSF with the, with the San Bart Bartholomew massacre isn't intuitively all that c clear. But I, I'm not going to hide the pleasure, and the real pleasure, in fact, that I had in reading Jeremy's book, which is the, the main reason why I invited him this evening, because it's extremely stimulating as, as reading goes. And on the other hand, the, these points of encounter between our, well, we will explain how the two come together b between MSF and uh, with the researcher. And also the themes which are explored in Jeremy's book. J Jeremy is an historian of the religious wars. He is a lecturer, uh, a, a certified researcher in history, modern history at Ex Marseille University. Last year, he has been in residence in the United States, and so he's not in France very much, which makes it all the happier that we're able to get our hands on him this evening. This book, To Ceux Qui Tombe, All Those Who Fall, uh, about the St. Bartholomew Massacre, and you can see the cover behind me, was published in, uh, last September, uh, and it, uh, the subject was a massacre, yeah, as many of you probably know from the, your studies. It was a massacre, which is, is now a part of the, uh, the popular French imagination. But what pr uh, Jeremy proposes, his way of going about it, it's a very different story that we are used to read or to teach and to learn to as uh, students, as I wrote in the invitation, which we sent out, the history of the massacre from below. Uh, it's uh, it's, uh, it's right, uh, in the caves of the Seine and the, the, in the gravel of the city is where he drew his history, his history from. It helps us to, to fill out in the historical accounts, and, but also to be, and also to write a political story, as it is usually uh, rather di very different from the way it's usually told. And so Jeremy has an, uh, acted as an investigator, and he went into the house of those people who were massacred. Not so much into the heads of the massacrers, but uh, uh, but rather in the house of his of their victims. Uh, to try to decipher the relation that exists beca become the executioner and their victims, uh, and which we will be more explicit about when we talk into it, because it echoes a lot with the more contemporary history, including the massacres in, uh, of, the, uh, of the Bosniaks, the Rwandans, or the Jews in Europe uh, during the Second World War. But uh, this is part of, and that is a part of the life of our organization. So it's a dialogue that we're organizing, following two conferences, recent conferences, having uh, having dealt with the uh, investigations uh, about extreme violence and their interpretations. So it's very common in our analyses, which are going to help us to examine. Uh, how this study of the uh, the wars of religions and the St. Barth Bartholomew could uh, illuminate uh, more recent massacres. And so th uh, this is a dialogue between us and Jeremy, but also of uh, contemporary historians. So it seemed to me that this dialogue is very promising and uh, once again, I'd like to express my pleasure at being able to receive Jeremy by keeping two things in mind. This work is a part of the continuity of two events we have organized over the last couple of years, the latest being Claudine Videl, 
in last November a book uh, uh, about uh, extreme violences in the DRC, in Syria, and in Rwanda. And in 2019, we organized a conference with uh, Nicola Mario, a question which is perhaps a little bit in parallel, who, uh, Nic uh, Nicola Mario, who wrote a chapter in the extreme violence book uh, launched by Claudine. And so there are a lot of bridges uh, be between uh, Jer Jeremy and us. And so I'd like to thank him for having accepted our invitation and especially because his, of his very few visits to Paris this year, so we feel very fortunate to have him with us. And so I'm not going to go on much longer. I'm going to give the floor, uh, the floor to Jeremy. In terms of, the, of Jeremy's uh, uh, presentation, we will try and engage a dialogue uh, with, here, so prepare your questions. We are also in streaming, and so we will get questions from the chat box online. And I would also like to invite you at the end of this discussion in an hour and a half or something like that uh, for an aperitif on the terrace to continue our questioning of Jeremy and trying to prize qu qu answers out of him. So thank you very much, uh, Jeremy. And also I'd like to thank to the interpreters and, and the control booth. I'd like to remind everybody to be able to speak slowly, calmly, directly into the microphone and things should run smoothly. So thank you very much, Mikhail. Uh, so the, and Crash, uh, and MSF uh, for your invitation. I'm very happy to find myself here. I know that this, uh, it's not my usual public as an historian. So I wanted to begin and knowing that I have a non-specialist public here, give you the context of the St. Bartholomew Massacre. But, uh, but you obviously are going to remember something about it from your studies in junior high school, high school. And so perhaps you saw Shiro's uh, marriage. It began with the marriage on the 18th of August, 1572. Uh, uh, Catherine de Medicis was the, fa the mother of the king and had been ruling as a regent in France for a long time. But she always wanted to try to reconcile Cath Catholic and Protestants uh, in opposition to, in fact, the usual reputation that she enjoys. But Catherine de, Medici de Medicis was a, a, a woman of peace, and to reconcile the Catholics and the Protestants, who had been divided uh, since uh, 1552, and so the St. Bartholomew Massacre wasn't just a lightning out of the blue, uh, because it had been brewing for years and years. The wars of religions uh, s s began in 1562. There are about 10 percent of the, the Protestants at the beginning of the uh, 60s. That is, 2 million Protestants living in France at the, for 20 million, 18 million Catholics, so about 20 million all told. Catholic Medici so wants to make wants to make peace. She has two main tools at her disposal. They have the edicts of pacification. These are edicts, which are laws who give the liberty of conscience to the free will to Protestants. Up until Catherine de Medici, the idea was to exterminate heretics, which the Huguenots were often considered. And so the prince's oath she wanted to exterminate the princes, the Protestants. And so uh, Catherine de, 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 de Medicis wanted to become, wanted to, to make the Protestants as a part of the European history. So in the first time of French history after the Germans, with the Protestants and Catholics should live together as friends and neighbors and they should tolerate one another. And it seemed self-evident to her, for the most part of the Catholics, uh, with the Protestants by their sides, they, uh, that is, that to be a Protestant means renouncing going to paradise. And, they, and so the Catholics uh, want to deep uh, uh, pollute the city, which is how the Protestants were often designated, in fact. If you accept to have a cousin or a brother who is an heretic, you're going to go to hell. 
So Catherine Medici's, in contrast to the radical positions, accorded this liberty of conscience to the Protestants. Uh, the second tool or second weapon, which is t uh, totally classic, is marriage. And so she gave her daughter, a Catholic daughter, Marguerite de, Val de Valois, uh, to the, mil the military leader of the Protestant, that is, uh, Henry IV. Uh, Henry IV is, is a blood prince. He has no. He has absolutely no. Uh, he has no chance of reigning. Now, with through this union with the Catholic princes, and they had children, which would be, should be able to recon, reconcile the two different religions. And this marriage took place 18th August 1572. Uh, uh, and before the massacre, there was there was parties in the street. Everybody was uh, was were celebrating. With the uh, St. Barth uh, Bartholomew massacre was not premeditated. We have, nobody can say that 18, on the 18th of August there would be a massacre. Uh, so I want to describe now the elements that led to the massacre. On the tw 22nd of August, four days later, uh, one of the Protestant leaders, his name was Coligny, who was a Protestant, was, shot, was, was killed. Oh, no, sorry, he wasn't killed, but he, but he was just seriously wounded with a, with, a, with a bow and arrow. And the Protestants who came to Paris for the marriage were absolutely furious. And so, and they blame um, uh, Catherine de Medici for having dragged them into a trap. And they saw it as a, a, a plot to exterminate them. Now, from that moment, don't forget it's hot because it's in the middle of August, and that didn't help things. So the, the Protestant leaders threat, threatened to leave Paris and to restart another war. In just a few hours, the peace plan and reconcil reconciliation by Catherine the, the Trek and Medici was threatened, was, was threatened. And in fact, it would lead to the opposite of what might happen. And it was to avoid this new war. That in the night on the 23rd, 24th, uh, 1572, two days after the attempted uh, murder of uh, Corigny, uh, Catherine de Medifis and her son decided to eliminate some 20 Protestant military leaders. It's kind of a classic attitude to take. In the, in the 16th century, it didn't pose, but it didn't lead necessarily to a massacre. But this was a preventive measure, some 20 Protestant military leaders. And so that is not, in theory, wasn't considered a, a massacre. And so it's sort of a, a crime of love to avoid a, another terrible wear, to, to avoid thousands of deaths. And that probably changed the, the destiny, and Coligny and all the Protestant military leaders, as you can see up here, uh, they are e defenestrated or they are just simply executed. Uh, you can see in the painting, it didn't exactly, exactly uh, like that. But then things really got out of hand. Uh, to understand the massacre on the ground, my book, as Michael explained, wants it to be a, a history from below. When I began working on this topic, there are 2,000 books about the San Bartholomew de Macassar, but what I wanted to do is change the focal point. Uh, there's always Catherine de Medici and Coligny, but I want, really wanted to scrape the ground to give names, faces, and the story of just simple people and who were the killers. And that has never been done. And so I was able to find archives to be able to, d to dig into them. The major historian who studied this is Demi Crozet, one of the great masters of uh, the War of Religions history. Denis uh, Crozier, uh, Crozier established, uh, put, got, uh, got into the imagination of the tours, that is, uh, uh, an imaginary which is related to the end of time, which, which, which made the two killers anxious, was the end of the world. 
Will they be raised when the, red, uh, when the Redeemer comes back to the earth to be taken into heaven? There we were convinced that the end of the world was close, <clears throat> and this involved this. And the engine, uh, for, uh, according to Cosé, is the anguish uh, eschatologique uh, 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 that had to do with the end of the world. So what should we do, they were saying, to be sa <coughs> saved the day when God or Jesus come, comes back to earth to, to split the good from the bad. I didn't want to go against this claim that the imagination of the killers uh, that religion is decisive in this, but, but I wanted to focus about what was happening below. How, you know, how, uh, why do we kill? And responded, because we are anguish and killing somebody is to try and get rid of the anguish, in fact, that they were subject to. I wanted to get more interested more in how they killed. In the analysis, leaving aside the why, uh, and so uh, I uh, I put away uh, uh, a theme, uh, uh, put about in an article about the why of the killing, but by showing that the killers were Nazis, and that racism and their ideology shouldn't be overestimated to the detriment of the the framework and the context in which that uh, enabled them to kill that that is with the, the idea in the, the heaven that pushed them to kill but they had the conditions the possibilities uh, the people they sur were surrounded by and the routines and the weapons that were used that's what i wanted to do for this for the 16th century so the first slide that you have before you is the obscure side of ca of the capital. You can see the so the final days of uh, Marie Passat, one of these victims. And uh, so the obscured side of the capital was illustrated by Marie Passat. She was a Protestant. She was arrested. Initially, in March uh, 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 in 1569, everybody saw her arrested. The St. Bartholomew was not premeditated, but it was prepared beforehand. It's very important to distinguish between the two. Uh, a, mass um, uh, a prepared massacre without being premeditated. Nobody knew that evening there would be a massacre. And yet it's impossible to do a massacre effective if you're not prepared beforehand. And so you could call this sort of the laboratory of the massacre. The people were ready to, to cause a massacre, but to be ready and to show it, we have to go back four years earlier. In 68 was the third war of religion. The, the Protestant, Protestantism was made illegal, illegal. There were the militiamen. These were your neighbors. There, there was no professional uh, police in the 16th century. These are the middle classes who were elected by their neighbors, and they are silversmiths, uh, but they, and they were elected to be the police of the area, to be able to, to track the heretics, among others. And these are militian, militiamen. In, uh, in 1568, they trained to throw their uh, Protestant neighbors in, in prison. And then you had Marie Passard in 1569, was arrested by uh, Thomas Croisier, uh, was a silversmith. He was going to be the worst massacre of the St. Bartholomew. A good uh, middle class citizen. But that was his sociological profile. So, what I try to show through these examples is that these militiamen. Uh, through their neighbors in prison, and they used the information, and they were decisive uh, on the night of the massacre. They memorized the names, they memorized addresses, they memorized know-how, 
and 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 then put the Protestants in prison. In the end, they were freed. And this is one of the frustrations of the Catholic uh, fanatic uh, Catholic militiamen, because the, once they arrested people, uh, these people were then eventually released. And so, and so once they finish their working day, they, they go chase the heretics. They last one, two, or three months, and then in the end, they were leave, they were freed. This was what happened between 68 and 70. The militia militia men who were going to become the killers in 1972 were training. They memorized their names and the faces. And the evening of the massacre, they knew who they had to strike and how to do it. I, I'm, I'm not saying it was uh, uh, premeditated, but they didn't know exactly. They didn't know if they'd have the opportunity to be able to go into the streets. But in 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 1570, they were they were uh, they were forbidden for prosecuting the Protestants from since 70, uh, but they were still training. It was a society we can understand that it was very bureaucratized. When historians, when they say that Catherine de Medici is responsible for the Saint Bartholomew mess, but she, she she ignored the in fact that there were any Protestants. She had no document distinguishing the Protestants from the Catholic in Marie de Medici's hands. But it was only in the memory of the neighbors who were able to put names and put addresses on the Catholics and the Protestants, even their close neighbor. You come from the same neighborhood, but uh, beyond that, nobody knew exactly who you were. And so the Protestants were that somebody, for example, somebody in the neighborhood could see if anybody went to, the, to mass or that they took care of their children and the way that they raised them. But Catherine de Medici's head was completely ignorant of that aspect of daily life. And in 70, the Protestants, many were converted to Catholicism. And so, so everything I was able to gain from this of the between the Tutsis and the, in Rwanda, the first uh, to authorize the massacre were the ones who were the closest friends and neighbors of the people who were first massacred, and the same thing pretty much happened in Paris in 1572. Uh, and so, what I w wanted to do is trying to understand the mechanism of how a neighbor, uh, where a Catholic and a Protestant resemble uh, like like two drops of water. But only the neighbors have the know-how of the evening of the massacre. So what happened to Marie Passard? She was arrested several times by Thomas Croisier and thrown into jails for several months. In the end, she was freed. And she, she carried out a, a request before the mother. She had eight children. And she was pregnant again, and she was freed on the condition that she remained locked uh, uh, into the house of, of a uh, of a catholic uh, relative because the uh, the situation in the prison were dramatic and the parliament agreed to free her on the condition that she remain with the catholic uh, relative she accepted and she went to one of her uh, relatives le peutre she spent the summer and in the end she was able to get out but I, I give you this anecdote because we learned through witnesses that the evening of the 24th of August in 72 was the ultra-Catholics who went to the aunt's house of my Pesar, who, who dragged her out of the house and they threw her into the Seine. So who had the resources that my Pesar uh, that her cousins that are, uh, were going to carry this out? So it wasn't the military people who dragged her out of the house. It was her cousins who did, her Catholic cousins, that, that made it possible to carry on business and to help the, 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 those the close relatives and to reverse things and to make it possible for her to, uh, to kill. So it's a matter uh, of, of the history from below as I try to recount in my book. And the other characters, the majority of the characters, uh, was uh, Coligny, Catherine de Medicis were the main figures in it, and possibly Charles IX. Uh, but it's somebody who was sensitive 
to the feelings of the people, the St. Bartholomew is committed by an anonymous co uh, crowd in, in anger. What I tried to demonstrate, it was in fact the opposite. There was no anonymous crowd that fought an anonymous crowd. There were specific victims who, were pick, uh, who, who knew one another, and the crowd would be unable to recognize the Catholic from a Protestant. It's not marked anywhere. In the 16th century, there were no, not even numbers in the street. There was just the Rue Saint-Denis, for example, without any numbers on them, near the crown or near the, the, the column. And so what I'm trying to demonstrate by studying this from below is they knew faces, they knew names, they knew houses belonging to these people. So what purpose would it serve to saying, uh, here's her, her, this is my passard, I found her will, uh, perhaps in the end it might be so just a poor piece of history. What, uh, what does it provide to, to carry names, to know the names? It seems to me that it is important. This enables us to write and uh, to be much more precise in our description of the massacre. It's not an anonymous story. Of, of a killer who doesn't know his or her victim, but neighbors who well identified and they attacked well identified victims. The 16th century author who helped me a lot in my research was Simon Goulard. He was a Protestant and he patiently collected uh, the names of the victims. He asked for letters, and he copied in the Mémoire de l'État de France uh, a history of the martyrs, uh, and he was not highly considered because uh, uh, showing that these people died as martyrs uh, was a bit uh, despised. But I've used uh, Goulard's uh, testimony uh, to find the names in the archives. Here, for instance, on the uh, uh, here you have the story of uh, someone who really struck me and it, it does explain why and how I have ex written this story you probably have it in front of you which reads Commissaire Robert so the police officer would thank the murderers who had killed his wife that's line 17 Commissaire uh, Robert thanked uh, the uh, man who uh, had killed his wife. And I read so many sentences like this, and it was really something that uh, moved me quite a lot. We are uh, paying great attention nowadays on uh, sexual and gender-based violence and uh, feminicides, as they're called. It's like this woman had died twice uh, she died at, at St. Bartholomew Massacre, uh, but she doesn't have any name. We only know that his, uh, her husband had her killed, and he thanked the murderers. Could we find the name of that woman? So that was my contribution. It's not a contribution to uh, uh, the great history, but in an instinct fashion, I found the name of this woman. Her name is Mary Robert, and I found the uh, inventory after her death um, uh, quite late, as you see, because uh, her husband, who is guilty of her death, did not disclose it, of course, and he lived in their apartment. I should have mentioned it usually. Uh, when somebody died, the inventory is made by the notary immediately after. No, Mr. Robert uh, lived in the apartment. Uh, this house actually belonged to his wife. So if your uh, wife is not dead, you can live in her apartment, but you cannot marry again. So you need a body uh, to make sure that uh, you are actually a widow. So he decided 
two years later to have the inventory made and that's how I found the name of uh, the uh, Mr. Robert uh, she had the name of her father and that's how I found out that uh, she ha they had two children that she was actually a Protestant because I found her books uh, she had a Bible in French and that was a sign of uh, being a Protestant because it was in French. The problem with this type of massacre for their contemporary uh, people is that bodies were not found. Protestants in Paris and Lyon and in Orléans were thrown out in the rivers uh, for purification purposes, they were taken to jail. They were massacred in conciergerie. Conciergerie is uh, close to Quai de la Magistrie, right in the city center along the river. And the water of the river is uh, uh, considered as the baptism water, and therefore the river would drag their bodies. So they were either thrown from the bridges or from the jails or they were put in mass graves in pré aux -Claire. that's close to Saint-Germain uh, today in Paris. But it raised problems uh, that could not be solved, particularly for those who wanted to take advantage of their death. If you put someone in a mass grave, you cannot uh, benefit from the uh, legacy, from the uh, uh, heritage. And some of the motives uh, for killing, when they're not religious motives, were economic motives. You get rid of a competitor, uh, the printing. You um, get rid of a, a competitor in the office when you work as a clerk. If you've thrown them at the river, how can you demonstrate that they were killed? As long as you don't have anybody uh, found, uh, then uh, there is no solution and uh, there was a kind of uh, action which was made. These uh, uh, Catholic who were uh, taking advantage of the story went to the notaries, to the solicitors, and here is the story of Louis Chenot. He was a professor of Hebrew. He died. He had been uh, thrown out in the river after his, he was beheaded. And those who perpetrated uh, this wanted to have access to his uh, succession, to uh, the uh, uh, what belonged to him. And they went to the notary, to the solicitor, to say, yes, we have seen the body and we've seen him laying on the ground. He had been killed. This document, the uh, words of the uh, witnesses, is a substitute uh, and a proxy to have access to the goods belonging to the killed Protestants. So historians could report these uh, short stories, which uh, so far had uh, not been uh, considered. I'd like also to tell you another story, that, or a third one, maybe, because there are many, many stories. That's uh, Antoinette in Toulouse. In Toulouse, uh, the massacre happened in October 1572, so that's two months after Paris. Her husband was Protestant, and she said she didn't know what had happened to him. When you lose contact more than two days with your relatives, you don't know what happened to those people. Her husband was actually killed at uh, uh, St. Bartholomew's. Uh, but the municipality of Toulouse needed money because uh, the massacre in Paris had been the uh, triggering element for a war. So the capital, the municipality of Toulouse, decided to sell all the belongings of Protestants, those who had been killed or who had run away. So they sent out police officers um, searching all the houses in Toulouse. They uh, dropped the list of everything that belonged to the Protestants and they confiscated all these goods in their houses. Antoinette had seven children. She uh, 
only had uh, one chest of drawer and they wanted to take her bed and the chest of drawer that she had so what is the tactic that she can use to uh, avoid this looting by the municipality and she shows that she is uh, she had been beaten that she was uh, beaten by her husband and she said I've always been a Catholic woman the very evidence of that is that my husband was a Protestant and he beat me and this was a certificate for her Catholicism the men whether they were Protestant or Catholic had the right to beat their, their wives at that time but here this woman reversed the stigma if you wish and used uh, uh, the bruises on her body to give evidence to the uh, police officer that uh, she had been beaten. I don't know whether she, they believed her, but they decided to uh, let her keep her chest of drawers and her bed. Now, who were the killers? Well, I've just talked about the victims, and now that I talked about the killers, and you have to go into the archives of Conciergerie, which was uh, the main prison in Paris. And as a miracle, the archives have been preserved since uh, uh, 1574, 64, sorry. Uh, so all the tropism of massacres of uh, previous historians is not to be put on the uh, sidelines. You really have to track back in history to understand what has happened. This is what I call the preparation of the massacres. Some Protestants were arrested. You have here the reason why people were arrested, because they were heretics. And then the explanation. Uh, he was formerly a lawyer at the, the uh, parliament. He is now is, uh, uh, from the city of Paris. And, and he lives uh, Rue des Prêcheurs. And uh, he's uh, taken as prisoner. Uh, by Nicolas Croisier and Claude Chenet. We are in 1568. Uh, the killers are there. They're preparing their killings. Thomas Croisier, Claude Chenet. We have their names and the names of the victims because they've arrested their victims in 1568. They arrested them in uh, 1569 and in 1570, and they killed them in 72, in 1572. Some 500 Protestants were arrested between 1560 9 and 1570, uh, uh, and they were arrested by four men. Uh, that uh, is Thomas Croisier, Claude Chenet, Nicolas Pelot. So there were no 5,000 killers. There was just a handful of killers, and they were getting trained to remember the names and the faces, the addresses, Rue des Prêcheurs. And here is the laboratory. Uh, of the massacre. It's the directory, if you wish, that they have outlined to prepare the massacre of uh, 1572. Next slide. And these killers have known each other for a long time. They're all colleagues. They are the uh, carrier of the uh, Saint Geneviève, who is the uh, holy uh, patron of Paris. Uh, they uh, have carried the reliquary of Saint Geneviève. And it's important to know that on the day of the massacre, if you are here along with your uh, colleagues or fellow friends, etc., it, it will make the massacre even more possible. You kill your uh, relatives with your friends. Thomas Croisier is with his the carriers of the reliquary of Saint Geneviève, and they have their own chapel. All the uh, member, uh, are, they are all members of this brotherhood. Uh, they have a, a chapel. They can you know, do some, uh, and they go to Saint Geneviève Church. They take their reliquary and they carry it in the streets of Paris. So they have their charisma. Uh, uh, so uh, they show it to the crowd. And so they have a religious charisma and they have a, a, um, the police officer charisma. Uh, with their uh, dress, they wear the uh, reliquaries. And on the day of the massacre, they will be respected and because of their charisma. 
And I also wanted to show you this archive to show you the uh, motives, different motives that were also used by uh, hundreds. Uh, you find uh, receipts, invoices signed by the killers. Uh, this one was signed by Claude Chenet, who was an executioner of uh, uh, San Bartholomew's massacre. He took all the belongings of the protestant and he issued a, a receipt. It was perfectly rational at the time, meaning that these men had a great interest in killing these protestants because they have basements and attics that are full of pieces of furniture and uh, belongings. Every time they arrested the protestants, they took their pop property. So they were arrested, and if these protestants never came back to uh, claim for their belongings and their property, no problem. So here is an acknowledgement of receipts uh, by a killer of the uh, San Bartholomew's uh, Day. And these are claims and complaints from uh, protestants to the French Parliament explaining that uh, there would be uh, ten, these that those people would kill them ten people who uh, looted their houses the Parliament carried out an investigation and decided to leave the property to the future killers and as I said quite quickly, I skipped some of the slides. If uh, they have indeed accumulated a, a, a lot of money and wealth, uh, in fact, they have a directory of all the Protestants in Paris. In Catherine de Medicis, the church, and the fanatic Catholics of the other towns, neither the King of Spain, Philip II, knew uh, the names of these protestants. Only those killers who I've mentioned, who've arrested the protestant, knew where the protestant were living, how to arrest them, and how to take them to jail. I'm not going to read this, uh, but this is one example amongst a hundred of a massacre uh, on August the 24th, which is targeting those people who were arrested in 1569 and they were arrested in the very houses where they used to live in 1569. So they just relied on the memory of the killers to find their victims. Most of the killers lived in Vallée de Misère. Vallée de Misère is today Quai de la Magistrie, which is a quay along the river, uh, right in the city center. It allows them to get rid of the bodies very easily. Most of the killers lived by the river very easily. They would knock at the doors of the protestants, as usual. It's uh, something that was repeated over and over again. So they knocked at their doors and they uh, took the protestant either to prison or to their homes. But their homes were very close to conciergerie. But Unlike in the previous years where eventually the protestants were released, they were killed and their bodies were thrown at the river. And they uh, uh, are uh, close to, therefore the killers lived close to the place of the massacre. And here is the Vallée de Misère. You see at the top the Quai de la Magistrie. and the Pont au Meunier from where the bridge from where the bodies were uh, thrown at the river and basements which were often described by the witnesses. Prisoners were taken to the house of uh, the killer, Thomas Croisier, for instance, at the first level. And you might think that it is almost naive or innocent so that the prisoners were taken to the first floor to be arrested. Then the door was closed, the protestants were killed, and their bodies were put down in the basement and thrown at the river. Meaning that 
eventually there is a dual habitus, a dual habit. And that's what I would like to highlight here. That is the know-how of killers is something that I have mentioned. They have remembered the names, the addresses and the faces, but also the victims. And I think it's quite uh, revealing uh, to uh, read many testimonies that the killers uh, would um, knock at the door and nobody had noticed that. And it's uh, quite recurrent. You know, well-educated people, they knock at the door and they wait for you to go down and open the door. They were very polite. And I thought, well, this is a very uh, revealing detail. It's an eye-opener. It tells that the victims have opened the doors and they knew that the neighbors did not like them, that they were uh, Catholic militiamen, and they knew that they would end up in jail. They knew that it's gonna be, it would be long, uh, that it would be difficult, that it would be taken to jail, but that it would be released from jail. So that's a terrible habitus or habit of uh, victims. Uh, the St. Bartholomew has already taken place because uh, usually when they open the door, they're taken to jail and then they go back home. While here, they do not respond collectively. You have a group of killers that are uh, in close cooperation with their relatives in their routine of uh, uh, killing and arrests while the uh, victims are just trapped from their homes uh, because they're just used to uh, being uh, victims. Somebody rings at the door, you go down, you open the door, it's your neighbor. Once again, he's arrested you once, twice, and then the story goes on. And you follow your neighbor to prison like it has happened a 200 times, as is shown in the registries of the Conciergerie prison. So 99% uh, of these actions were the same. The... Uh, 1% remaining is the killing. You cannot understand uh, what happened in the remaining 1% if you haven't understood that there was indeed a thorough preparation and that the victims will no longer uh, defend themselves and they followed their uh, killers. I still have some time? I'm fine? Okay. When uh, you discover the boxes uh, containing the uh, notary or the solicitor's document. There were 80 such solicitors in Paris and you have all these documents that they would write. And I went through uh, what was uh, written by these solicitors between August the 24th, 1572 and August the 30th. And they talk about everything except the massacre. And I was pretty disappointed uh, they didn't talk about it. Then, you know, they had uh, deeds of people buying horses, uh, people who died quietly. There's nothing mentioned about the massacre. Most of the documents that were produced and written during one of the first massacres of the French history has nothing to do with it. It's quite difficult to analyze, and I do not claim that I have been able to analyze it, but I would like to draw some conclusions, and I'm hoping that they will be in line with what I've said. The massacres were perpetrated by 10 men who went to search for the Protestants, put them in prison. Thomas Croisier claimed that he killed 400 Protestants, and I think it's true. One man can kill five, 400 men. 10 men, it's 4,000 people killed. And that's approximately the number of people who were killed in Paris in Bartholomew's days. So you have a handful of killers and a handful of uh, righteous people. That is, a few Catholics who decided to save uh, the Protestants. And uh, they went to the notary, to the solicitors, and s were making oaths and swearing that their neighbors were not Protestant but Catholics. So a handful of killers and a handful of uh, savers. And in the middle, a huge a range of possible attitude. Uh, 
uh, and behaviors faced with the massacres. That you can find in the solicitor's deeds. Most of the Parisians did not take part in it. It doesn't mean that they were condemning it. Difficult to say from these archives, but it's there's a whole range of possible uh, behaviors. Uh, those who took advantage of the situation, but who weren't to loot the houses and plunder the houses of Protestants after they killed, those who um, were happy, but silently happy after the death of these Protestants, those who didn't kill, but uh, did, uh, didn't save any Protestants, even though they were silently condemning the massacre. You know, what does that mean to pay for the rent or buy horses or for a house on August the 25th, 1572? Does that mean that you're selfish? You're paying your rent or you're buying your house while your neighbors are being killed? Difficult. It's a question that I'm asking. Difficult to grasp what it means. Is it a, 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 a proof of indifference that you're turning a, a, a blind eye to the massacre of your neighbors? Or there are two possible ways to understand that. Uh, uh, depending on people's uh, behavior. You know, uh, carry on with your routine means that you don't want to be involved in the massacre. Uh, one could have a generous reading of the humanity and say that performing your jobs as if nothing had happened is a way to resist and not be involved. You know, I'm busy working, I have to pay rent, I have to buy a house, I'm taking my son for apprenticeship. It's not my uh, uh, understanding, it's just one way of understanding. Uh, people uh, when faced with uh, such a situation. My conclusion is that uh, these documents are bearing testimony of uh, something that is essential to understand is that there is a freedom to kill. It's the opposite of this idea which I think is wrong said that there is a kind of religion here at the top that was imposed down to people of the 16th century and encouraged them to kill. No, it's just killers who decided to pick their victims. They had the freedom not to kill, while others in the 16th century made other decisions. Uh, men of the 16th century had also moral feelings just like us. So we should put an end to this moral relativism and say, well, a moral if the 16th century had no moral feelings and it was normal to kill in the 16th century, nor even in the 16th century, it was not normal to kill. Most of the uh, people in Paris, Lyon and Toulouse didn't kill. Only a handful of men in prisons, they killed people in prisons at night. And the other is... Uh, remained silent uh, while condemning or uh, turned a blind eye, but they were not killers. The freedom to kill or not to kill and to uh, cause a massacre or not is a very important concept to remember from this episode of the history. Well, thank you very much, Jeremy. Thank you. I didn't have any questions. You already... Um, have answered all the questions, so let's go for a drink right away. So, well, I'll start with and fire first question uh, before giving the floor to the participants. One of the aspects that you haven't mentioned here today is the conclusion, which is that what happened to the killers and beyond to this uh, simple question. Uh, my question might be a bit more complicated. What about the, the posterity of this massacre? Did this massacre help uh, people in Toulouse, Lyon and Paris understand uh, the massacre? Uh, were they shameful of what had happened? And uh, were they prepared for the future? Well, thank you for this question, which helps me to be more specific about two items. The killers were not prosecuted, and it's quite normal. Amnesty it was the policy of Catherine of Medici. In order to lead 
uh, country and to take it out of the war, uh, you uh, forgive. And the killers of St. Bartholomew was n never uh, prosecuted in France. Not only did they enjoy uh, um, amnesty, but also they were rewarded. And that's uh, even more puzzling. And that's uh, something that I have to difficulty to link up with my preliminary remarks. In the archives, uh, you find a few documents uh, from which you s read that uh, the uh, killers were rewarded by uh, the crown. Nicolas Pezou, one of the, fir of the, one the fierce uh, killers, was a provost uh, for the south of France. He was appointed by Catherine de Medici in 1573. Why were they rewarded? I don't know. But most of the killers in Paris, in Rouen, Orléans, Toulouse, uh, died quietly. Uh, as uh, old and rich people. What was the second question? What about the prosperity of these massacres? Well, indeed, a massacre uh, leads to a massacre. Uh, there were massacres in 1562 and in 1568. So in 1572, it was even worse. But it was the last one. What I meant is that uh, St. Bartholomew's massacre was the worst of the wars of religion. But the last one, after uh, St. Bartholomew's, uh, there was no longer any massacre afterwards. And that's uh, something that has been analyzed by Nicolas Croisé, which is that the radicals, the Catholic, the radical Catholics, started to realize that killing was useless. Uh, you know, they put all their energy in killing uh, and to exterminate the heretics, as they called them at the time. But they were still there. The next day in Paris, there were still Protestants in the city of Paris. And uh, that's also a feeling of guilt. The Catholics developed a new imaginary, which is that if God has sent out heretics on earth, it's not uh, to so so that we would punish them, but to punish so that God punished us, and that herit the heretics will be will no longer be there when we are better Christians or better Catholics. So the Catholics' violence against Protestants up until 1572, and after that date, the violence was against Catholics themselves who were self-punishing themselves and and had the uh, penitent uh, spirituality which was that of the 17th century with this idea that we as Catholics should be better uh, Catholics and once we're pur purified uh, by self-punishment, by fasting, once we have done that then God will extermin exterminate and get rid of the heretics. We thought that uh, God gave us the order the pro to kill Protestants, but it was a misunderstanding. But in fact, he was asking us to be better Catholics. And uh, this massacre was the last one. And then the violence uh, was uh, an inner, became an inner violence after having uh, been an outer violence or a violence ag against people outside. So there are questions from the chat and questions from the floor. This is your first question from Jeremy. <coughs> from the chat, Claudine and Rony afterwards. Uh, we can, uh, Rony and Claudine can ask the questions at the same time. And perhaps answer two or three questions at once. The first question is from Christopher, who asks, what was the visibility of the massacre in the city, in the various cities? We talked a lot about Paris, but we also talked about Toulouse. We also mentioned Rouen and Lyon. And so the book goes from one city to the next. What was the visibility of the massacre keeping? As you said, the killing uh, took place behind, uh, behind closed doors and seen by very few people. What did the Parisians know of the massacre? Perhaps we can go to Claudine first, then Rony, and then you can perhaps answer the three questions at the same time.
The visibility is something very important because when we saw the pre uh, presentation, representations of the movement, there are very few. We saw in the beginning is the Francois Dubois painting, who was a, an escapee. It shows scenes of massacres in the street, a lot of uh, cadavers lying in the street. And my theory, well, my, my assumption is that the witnesses overestimated the publicity of the massacre is, is traumatizing with the ca cadavers in the street. So we have a tendency to only moan that, but all the deaths who died in the street. But in reality, it, especially during the first hours, your people are thrown out the windows. They had the murders in the street in the first hours. But very quickly, the visibility of the of the massacre disappeared, and the majority of the massacre, uh, which explains its effectiveness, were committed behind closed doors in prison or in the house of the of the people who were massacred. There was a certain chaos in the street in the beginning, and it was fairly visible. But in a second phase, the, uh, there were, the massacre disappeared behind closed doors. What struck me in your book of the resonance that I could have with I studied in Rwanda. In Rwanda, you had a beginning before the real massacre uh, kicked in. But apart from the killers who are, are seen to be punks and, uh, and bad elements in the street, and it was fairly anonymous. But, but in fact, it didn't happen like that. We knew in the communes and inside the communes, and there were even parts of the communes where the massacres were triggered thanks to neighbors. And here I identify entirely with your, uh, your issue when you say that. But there's one point on which you insisted, and which I insist as well, the microorganizations. These are people who are not at all uh, from uh, who, uh, in the ground, but they have a certain status because cer only people with a certain status can organize massacres, even the right to kill. You don't kill just any old way. So I want to insist on that, but it's true in Rwanda. In the communes, in the towns, with, uh, there were a few leaders who were fairly notable people in the area, and they, and they form a, a, a band, and it's a band that kills. And this, this group uh, had studied this beforehand. They knew one another, if, even if they hadn't killed before, but they knew one another very well in their relationships with the Tutsis. But at the same time, when I read Cose at the time and Goulard, and you, you say that in Goulard's account, they see the, the neighbors who kill and they see them occu occupy the street, noisy and ge gesticulating. But it's absolutely a description uh, of these killers in Rwanda. You had, you had gangs constituted by leaders, but not everybody killed in, in the gang. But they uh, they monitor the situation and they pass messages between themselves, and it becomes public and rather more professional. And and I think there really is a similarity between these two events, between what you've described and uh, what we saw in Rwanda. Boy, I have other things I can speak about, but I, I don't want to go on too long. But the but babies were killed in the St. Bartholomew. Did, did they kill babies? Killing fetuses, that's a, almost a classic uh, act. But uh, were there very much, was there, was there very much rape? I don't know if that had occurred or not. But I would like to also make a short remark on the people who worked on Rwanda. They were not the first of uh, working on massacres of, uh, of, of the neighbors. A little bit later in your book, you, you, you quote Fuji in 
1900, after the book about Rwanda in 1990-something, in, uh, in 1997, and the quote that you give by Duma in, in uh, 1721. But it came after other which had already deciphered what had happened with these gangs and these gangs uh, of neighbors killing one another. I haven't got a lot I can add to that. But I think uh, for the for historians uh, like me, Dumas, for non-specialists, Dumas uh, highlighted uh, things, uh, aspects of the massacre that we were ignorant of. I'm sensitive to to this point that we can compare the two events. In my book, I, tr I try to do it, obviously, by, uh, by maintaining the singularity of the context. But it seems to me it makes it possible to talk about it uh, and that we meet this evening. In fact, this uh, enables to draw a line between the two, the, uh, talking about violence, that each has its own singularity. The Saint Bartholomew has, was unique in many ways. It was mostly religiously based, but it also has the social uh, aspect to it. By saying it's not the same thing, but the similar mechanisms. And I was I, I was uh, fueled on the work on Rwanda, and the work on the former Yugoslavia and other kinds of genocides because I try to understand the passage passage to act and this uh, aspect of the gang mentality. And I wanted to put it in the context itself. And th thank, you, uh, thank you very much for having stressed that point, which I think is absolutely valid. Now, concerning rape, during the religious wars, yes, there was a lot of it. But I have to admit that on the St. Bar Bartholomew, I'm less sure. The fetuses uh, were ri uh, ripped from their mothers, and they were massacred, and the uh, toddlers were massacred as well. But as far as rape is concerned, I don't really know. I have to, I have to check that. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation, which I found was really pertinent. But there are several things you talked about when you said that you, you took a certain distance in relation to a certain relativism of the historian, but nonetheless, there are things that uh, seems that uh, the violence is more acceptable for the putting to death of the officer or the, pro uh, the Protestant notables uh, to calm the situation down. Uh, when we did, when uh, Catherine de Medicis decided to kill 20 people, which obviously had done nothing as such, but to try to calm the situation down. But uh, uh, other other leaders take perhaps more precautions. But uh, just a couple of questions I wanted to ask. And concerning the just, what, what, what do you mean by that and that there was it their desire to save kill, uh, somebody who was going to be killed? My second question goes along the same lines. What was the attitude of the church? Especially you mentioned that Toulouse, the massacres happened two months afterwards. So there was a certain delay which, uh, which enabled this reaction. Did the church make any pronouncements on the uh, two massacres? I think concerning the first, I exaggerated a bit on the issue of the relativity, but of course the the acceptability in the 16th century was higher or lower, but the violence is more acceptable. But it was the rate of criminality was much higher in the 16th century than it is today, and th and that seems an important point. And your second question concerning the attitude of the church. 
Now, the just, uh, I use this term uh, ironically so that somebody, that would, resou uh, uh, that would uh, resound in the ears of the reader, but there, is no, there are no eyewitness accounts of the uh, just. That in everything I said, that I am the one that is that am, uh, that have uh, that have projected that. But there are the gestures of the just, because and they are gestures of the just, because accepting the 25th of August in uh, in uh, 1572 to leave one's house to go to a notary and to certify that you had witnessed the this this neighbor at at the mass, and I knew that my neighbor didn't go to the mass. I know that we have neighbors who went to the notar notary with a, with a goal to, to, to lie, but they saw the Protestant at the Mass when, in fact, they weren't. But on the day of the St. Bartholomew, uh, that, that is what um, questioned me. And the Church uh, remained fairly silent on the whole thing. The priests of Paris and elsewhere. Uh, the, there was a Jesuit, Edmond Roger, who was a Jesuit priest who pushed people to murder. And he really encouraged uh, people to murder. Uh, there was a note ta taken in August of, uh, 1572, and the Pope uh, celebrated the Jubilee. Uh, of the people who were uh, massacred at the St. Bartholomew, and they was even awarded a medal for it. But they condemned the, uh, the policies of Catherine de' Medici to want to try and reconcile the two sides. I have a question just before giving the floor to Michel. To come back to this utilization of historiography that you made, uh, this contemporary thing that you do, and we talked about Rwanda, there were references to Rwanda and also to the Shoah, and this uh, Monsieur Bauman who did this work. Now you're talking in the micro historical micro geography, something which for the Parisians, which is very impressive. I personally feeling this uh, strolling through the neighborhoods uh, historically in your book, I found extraordinary. Is it a project to to make a bridge between the contemporary history and these uh, these more these more ancient uh, histories? Uh, but is a project that, that came into it. Are these are people that you discovered as you went along, or this was just was this an attempt on you on purpose to try to uh, to discuss the more recent past rather than the the farther off past? As an anecdote in the book, uh, Jeremy doesn't hide himself. There are chapters which is called uh, "Goodbye, Children," or uh, "Without uh, Without Without Pity" or "Chagrin." And so you, you, you very much accepted, in fact, that it was a part of the project itself, that is to insert yourself in the history. How did you come to that method? When one is an historian, and we all go through a period where we should commit the sin is of anachronism, and that's the first thing that we learn, that anachronism is absolutely banned. And so when we began coming out of that phase of my studies and became an, uh, a professional historian, is Niccolo Rollo, who wrote a book and he talked about anachronism, to say that it's impossible and not desirable to not project our desires and our curiosity into contemporary history and on to the past. And uh, Nicolas Rollo says that the, the present are the main impulse to try to understand. When I read the, the, about the massacre of the St. Bartholomew, I look at through the, the filter of the drama of the, of the 17th century, that is, the prosecution of the Jews. I prefer to write it 
so that people can understand, which moves me. And when I read about the uh, drama of the 16th century, because we don't study St. Bartholomew in the same way before and after the Shoah. And so we have to accept that. And we have to own that idea that as we have to, as uh, one of my titles is, uh, talks about the drama of the 20th century, to give the reader the possibility of what I'm talking about. The historian is not located, located in, in the ether or just in the land of ideas. The historian has to be located in a given time and in a family story and to locate in that. And so I, I would rather own that than have to have a, a universal uh, pretension it's no, not by chance, there are a lot of historians of the religious wars uh, who, who are historians who come from Jewish families, who work on the persecution of the Protestants. It's a way not to work on the persecution of the Jews or to continue on the persecution of the Jews by, by putting a little bit of a distance between the two. But that is a method which I really uh, hold close to my heart. I saw uh, there's a, a site on Twitter called Anachronics. Michel Cojon, thank you for your presentation. But I wonder if there was a specific role of the women uh, in, this, in this whole episode. Did they contribute to it? Did they oppose it? And were, were they able to have access to weapons or access to the prisons? How do we characterize their role uh, as observers? Did they act as a break or not at all? Or was the massacre simply the domain of men? It's an important question, but I think it's a, f a weak point in my book. I didn't question this point, in fact, in the book. But I think there is a, 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 a kind of person and a group of killers are all male. And that's, that's for sure. The, the band of killers e evolved in a solidarity and a masculine uh, fraternity. The, 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 carrier, the porters of the saint jean Vier, for example, was a, was a purely male fraternity. Having said that, in the contemporary eyewitness accounts, there were accounts of women who were, they, they didn't commit violence directly, but women who let violence occur or they denounce the husband who refuses to open the door to, to a Protestant seeking help. And that is due some to the misogyny of the time uh, that the construction of the whim, the woman who refused to save her husband, her Protestant husband, for example, or the woman who didn't open her door, or a woman who called for the killers to carry out the, the dirty job. But it was very much a, a very much phallocratic society. And so I'm not friends, so it's the first time that I've heard this story. And so I may make a fool of myself with my question, but if I've understood, in you said that that the Protestants were there consisted of about ten percent of the population, and that there were four thousand people killed during the massacre. So I imagine four thousand Protestants is far from the ten percent of the population in Paris at the time. And if these extremist Catholics had a goal to exterminate the Protestants in Paris, why did they choose uh, such a, a, an amateur method? Why didn't they try to recruit people to kill more? Do you see what I'm getting at? They chose a, a fairly ineffective method, as it were. It's a, it's a relevant remark. Uh, it, it, I think this demonstrates my assumption. They couldn't recruit more people because you didn't have as, as many killers as that to be able to carry out the, the, the dirty job. And so they were as effective as possible for them, that is, uh, gather the Protestants together and kill them. But obviously, 
three or four thousand, three or four thousand deaths in Paris was significant at the time. It was very little in relation to the total uh, Protestant population. But they reached their goal in another way. There were massive abjurations, massive conversions after the Saint Bartholomew. The 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 escaped Protestants w uh, uh, raced to the church to convert themselves. Whereas in the 1560s, France could could have become part, uh, Protestant because there was a dynamism in, in the Protestant movement which was very strong at the time, and the Saint Bartholomew broke that dynamic. But in the 1560s, with, uh, after this gesture, you could believe that the country could turn Protestant. For, uh, very shortly, because there was a free atmosphere where they could kill. Is that why they stopped killing? Because they saw it didn't produce the effects they wanted. Or maybe they were just uh, t tired of killing people. Why did they stop, in fact? It, it's, I've never asked the question in quite such a way, but in fact, it's quite a good one. Because they're living in a state of law in the 16th century, and the, and the king uh, issued uh, edicts to stop the massacre because it couldn't continue when the, uh, when the, raw, when the king, in the 10th text that he issued, if, uh, after five or six years of chaos, they might uh, ignore the royal edicts. But after that, it became very difficult. After that, they killed everything they could kill in prison. There were a lot of men who were picked up and put in prison, and they were all killed. And so there was just a lack of material, as it were, because it was much more complicated to go out into the street and look for them rather than dragging them into prison and killing them there. So you said there was a tension, which I, th I, which is very rich around the issue that you raised about whom were we talking about? You pointed the finger at individuals uh, who were uh, they were they were killers. Uh, n nonetheless, you typified them as a social group. Could we also characterize them in a certain way politically? Could we say that one of the reasons that they can do what they did, but they had to stop at a certain point, and then they were rewarded for it, were they seen as an individual or seen as a representative of a larger group? And they were seen as people who had a program and uh, and they and to whom they uh, people made concessions to a certain point. Perhaps that had an aspect to it. Yeah, I I think you're right. Uh, it's one of the ways to explain, and it's a good way to explain. So it would be the entry through a political program. And these men. A political program, why not? They, they had a political uh, bias and was absolutely opposed to that of Catherine de Medici, who wanted peace and they wanted violence. And Catherine de Medici had to m make do with this uh, political aspect of it. it. It could be an angle of attack. Today, in any case, uh, in the majority, of the history is what we see. We we have a religious reading of the ideas uh, pronounced by these men that they promoted, the, and they moved them. They were religious ideas. They were not political uh, ideas. They were religious ideas, which were which moved these people. Uh, 
uh, you can see it from a, uh, under a political light. But we have a tendency over the past few years uh, to point our fingers at the religious aspect of it, but it's an intelligent, it's an, uh, uh, an intelligent pathway that, the, that the, where this issue could be approached, and uh, they had to stop. Mark, my question might not be the right one because it's pretty much based on reading of the uh, Dumas, the uh, French writer Alexandre Dumas. You've said that uh, this massacre was a massacre from below. Now, Alexandre Dumas, in his novel, says that the uh, Duc de Guise uh, the aristocrats had armed groups around them, uh, heavily uh, armed, and that these extremists in the French aristocracy, were they passive in this massacre, or did they get involved, or am I completely wrong and that Alexandre Dumas made it up? No, no, you're right, and so was Alexandre Dumas, uh, the... Uh, 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 Allies of Duc de Guise were seen in the streets of Paris, looting, plundering, and killing. Duc d'Anjou was the brother of Charles IX, the future Henry III, the Duke of Alençon, uh, the uh, younger brother of Charles IX, had their uh, militias, uh, their uh, closed relatives. But unlike Dumas, I don't think that It was uh, the uh, social group uh, which was the majority of killers. Those men were violent. It was also about their reputation. But it's not the core group that perpetrated uh, most of the killings. And of course, uh, Alexandre Dumas is wonderful. And Patrice Chéreau's film uh, is even more wonderful than the book but it's a vision that is exclusively happening in the Louvre with uh, the uh, aristocrats which does not cover the the uh, actual the reality of the massacre which was the streets of Paris and the uh, uh, the, the common people of Paris Bertrand for the following question in the meantime while the microphone is being uh, brought to Bertrand. I'll step in, uh, says uh, Michael. What you've described about these uh, militiamen who are uh, pretty much present uh, in this book, it's in Paris quite, you know, that they repeated their um, crimes. But what about outside Paris? Was it the same process? It seems that it's more heterogeneous outside Paris, so you had groups, but also, you know, individual stories. The rector of the university who was uh, condemned by his immediate competitor, but you don't know who kills whom and how and why, but you know who uh, was the mastermind between the killings. So it doesn't seem that it was the same trend as in Paris, you know, the bourgeois with their weapons who were repeatedly arresting the Protestants and then killing them. Well, I mainly talk about the Paris uh, killers and I'm not so, uh, not so accurate about the other, is it outside Paris? It's because there is a gap of archive and there is in Paris something which is the Minutier Central des Notaires Parisiens, which is the central registry of all the notaries. And it's a wonderful source of document. Maybe there is the same in Lyon. And uh, based on what I've observed, the same mechanisms, but it uh, was not so accurate. So it were the same groups of killers who got trained over the years in Lyon, in Toulouse. Toulouse. Michel Delpech was a merchant. He was extremely rich. He still has his uh, uh, Rue des Champs in Toulouse. So if you have the opportunity, you can go and see it. 
He had his personal army and he was one of the leaders of the killings in Toulouse. And I'm hoping that younger historians will take up from my book and you know, delve into the archives of Toulouse and Lyon and they would make far more accurate uh, portraits than I would. Uh, well, uh, my question is in line of your question, Michael, because there are two issues, uh, as far as I understand. It's about the nature of archives and the fact that the uh, notary or the solicitor's archive are uh, the registry of those who had a property. So what about those who had no property at that time? And those who are not from Paris, because uh, you're talking about the proximity massacre in a well-defined area, but there was, uh, there were waves of people from province going to Paris because of the royal wedding. So were they people from provinces also victims of the massacre? And you've talked and. Uh, uh, the, com the police officer who thanked the killer for having killed his uh, wife. Uh, so what is the, the link there? Well, Nicolas Aubert was a Catholic and his wife was a Protestant and she ruined his career. She had him thrown to jail. There was uh, what was found in their house were eggs uh, during a... Uh, um, the fasting season, you know, you're not supposed to have eggs or meat in your house during this period. So they found uh, this in the house of uh, the uh, police officer. It was during Lent, sorry. So during Lent, they found meat or, or eggs, and uh, it was probably because of his wife, but he was arrested and taken to jail because of his uh, wife. The, uh, regarding your first question, uh, it's not the same mechanisms. When these uh, Protestants from outside Paris came for the wedding and were killed, they were not killed like the uh, well-known uh, Protestants from Paris known by the militiamen. I have fewer sources to describe them and describe their killings, and that's in line with another question which was asked earlier. When I can analyze it and the foreign Protestants were killed by the aristocrats, by the uh, brothers of uh, Charles IX, the king, by Henri d'Anjou et Alençon. So there is, if you wish, uh, there is a homogeneity between those who, were, who came and were killed. Uh, because there were nobles, those who traveled to attend the wedding. So they were killed, and it's the aristocrats, the Catholic aristocrats, who killed them, namely those who were uh, with uh, Duc d'Anjou. The social bias of the um, notary um, registries is not that much of a bias. Of course, you find some people who are not so well off. For instance, the notaries will not make an inventory of after death of uh, somebody uh, who did not uh, have anything. The notaries and solicitors are interested in money. So you will find people who pay their rent. Uh, you have uh, some uh, daily workers uh, in the uh, uh, notaries' registries. I don't think there is such a huge social uh, gap. You know that historians and uh, uh, that uh, archivists will uh, ill-treat uh, the women and the poorest people. There's a question from the back, but then I've received also another question in the chat. William is head of operations, and he was for a long time head of programs in Central African Republic, which is a fertile ground for uh, massive killings. And uh, if I interpret his question correctly, he's uh, asking whether at uh, the time of uh, St. Bartholomew, some victims became 
uh, executioners. Because it does happen, you know, out of revenge, retaliation, people who were on the side of the victim and uh, became executioner because of these peaks of violence around uh, St. Bartholomew's Day and uh, massacre. Well, thank you for this question. I don't know whether I can answer this directly, but uh, here is my answer. Primo Levi sheds light on this and says, executioners are well positioned to be saviors. And he noticed that uh, mercy and uh, uh, ruthlessness come, sometimes can be found in the same human being. And St. Bartholomew's massacre struck me because quite often, not so often, it happened that some uh, executioner uh, executioner saved people, the uh, members of the Guise family, who were known for killing many people in their uh, mansion, also saved Protestants. Those who were killers were well positioned sometimes to uh, stop killing someone and they would not be prosecuted for that because they were already known as uh, killers. And then there is the guilt of the survivor Protestants who to survive and to run away from Paris um, pretended or claimed that, that they were killers. I, have, I don't have more details than that. Does that mean that uh, they uh, put the uh, uh, signs of the killers. They had a white uh, mark on their uh, clothes. Uh, there is uh, someone in Orléans, a Protestant, who was hidden by the family of the militiamen, and every night they were uh, rejoicing, uh, the looting and the killing, and he pretended he was a Catholic, and he had to dance and sing and, um, you know, entertain them. And he reports about this inner uh, tragedy. And he was wondering whether he was an executioner because he was in the house of the executioners and uh, pretended that he was a Catholic himself. No, in this gang of uh, Parisian or Toulousian killers, Had uh, some of them experienced violence uh, against their families or their, their relatives? Is it something that drove them to actually become killers and executioners? Well, difficult to tell individual, individual by individual, but we know that these massacres happened in, except for Paris, where the St. Bartholomew's Day happened uh, by those who were traumatized by 1562, which was the peak of uh, French Protestantism, where there were Protestants in cities in Lyon, in Rouen, and in Toulouse. So the Catholics who killed did that out of revenge from the stroma of 1562. In Rouen, in Normandy, for instance, when a uh, Laurent de Maron, one of the executioners, one of the greatest killers, was a victim in 1562. He was taken to jail for two years. So he had enough time, you know, to uh, pile up and uh, stack up his, his uh, uh, feeling of revenge. I have a very... Uh, my understanding of this uh, and my reading of all these testimonies is that I would be have more sympathy for the Protestants, that is, for the victims, than for the killers. But some of the killers uh, saw themselves also as victims. In Lyon, one of the worst executioners of St. Barthélemy had lost his brother in 1562 uh, in, during the war against Protestants. So that's true. It's true at the uh, level of individuals and at collective levels. Thank you.
for this very rich presentation. I'm a poor historian and I'm getting old, so I don't remember uh, everything that I was taught at junior high school that you referred to. But so far, I've lived with this idea that the massacre or that St. Bartholomew's Day uh, in Paris was not the end of the killing of Protestants in France. You've referred also to Rouen and other places. Now, in relation to your uh, uh, thesis and what uh, your ideas, and I'm sorry, I still haven't, haven't read your book, I would like to know if you have found the same making of a non-premeditated massacre, but rather prepared massacre in all the towns where there were St. Bartholomew's massacres? And if so, it's a strong assumption, or was it more specific to the history of Paris? Then where did it happen? Were the massacres throughout France during several uh, weeks or a month after uh, the 15th of August with a, a, an outbreak from Paris that spread throughout the country? Oh, was there more organization in Paris, which was then the cluster to spread it out in other towns? And did you find the same mechanisms as the ones you have described, uh, that is, uh, proximity, uh, neighbors, uh, the routine? Well, the answer is yes. The short answer is yes. But they were not so accurate uh, because uh, I have the wealth of archives is not uh, the same in other cities than Paris. And whenever I could, I could demonstrate exactly the same uh, trend of preparation. In Rouen, uh, those who got trained uh, had trained for 10 years. In Lyon, same. Uh, the killers uh, got trained for 10 years. But there is a, a specific nature to what happened outside Paris, which is that St. Bartholomew's massacre had already happened. When it happened in Lyon, it was on August 31st. So that's one week after Paris. They already knew what was going to happen. They knew what was going to happen because it had happened in Paris. So uh, the uh, surprise element and disorganization outside Paris were uh, um, to a lesser extent. So there was far more premeditation in the provinces than in Paris, because the king had written letters and said there was a massacre in Paris. I don't want the same to occur in other places of the country. So the local uh, king's representatives, the local governors, uh, put the Protestants in jail to protect them. most likely to avoid uh, the Protestants and to prevent them from leaving town and taking weapons. So in all these towns, Bordeaux, Paris, uh, Rouen and other places, that they Protestants were put in jail and they were killed in the jails. In Toulouse, as explained, I was in Toulouse uh, over the weekend and I, I had a guided visit of the uh, St. Bartholomew's Day. It was uh, August, uh, no, it was September, August, October, sorry, it was in October, so October 3rd and 4th uh, at Saint Francois, Saint Francisco Day in uh, Toulouse, so that's um, two months after Paris. Right after the Paris massacre, the Protestants of Toulouse were put in jail. So they had been in jail for a month. Uh, they were uh, weakened, they were vulnerable, they were defenseless. And it was even easier to kill them in Toulouse uh, because it was far more prepared uh, than in Paris. Those who got the information early on uh, ran away. Uh, many Protestants uh, run away from uh, Lyon and Toulouse. Those who could not run away were found in a convent in Toulouse and then they were put in jail. And the troop of killers that I've just described one day decided 
to get the keys of the uh, jails. They had the list of people, they had their names, and they killed them one after the other. It's a terrible ending, I'm sorry. I was about uh, to talk about uh, those people who had run away, exile, etc., but uh, that's the end of the story, unfortunately. I'd like to conclude here. You answered the question I wanted to answer. Uh, the, the question I wanted to ask you, that is whether people had uh, information early enough to run away. So thank you very much for this. I strongly recommend the reading of this book, To Ceux Qui Tombe, All Those Who Fall. And I will invite you to read it. Jeremy has uh, also uh, been invited on the French radio stations for uh, some programs. And he's also uh, present on, on the social media. So there are a few radio programs you can find on France Culture, actually, uh, where he talks about uh, uh, this event. Well, as usual, for those of you who are here with us, we are inviting you for a drink on the eighth floor. Thank you very much, Jeremy, for having spent some time with us. Thank you to Tim and Agnes, our interpreters and to our technicians for having made this event possible. And thank you to all of you. And the next uh, conference is on uh, June the 28th. And we'll talk about uh, North Kivu and DRC. So please come back. Thank you very much.